Okay, great. Um, well, first, just to say how nice it is to come to this uh, workshop, actually, for the first time. Every year, sort of, one's been vaguely aware that it's taking place, and uh, it's been really uh, fun and enjoyable to be here, so thank you for that. What I wanted to do was actually do two things. First, rather quickly, frankly, just remind you of some of the, I think, constraints on at least the outcome of quenching that come through looking at the uh, evolving population of galaxies, stressing it's really, I'm talking about the population, I'm trying to see uh, uh, simplicities, symmetries, if you like, in the population, and what that tells us for at least the outcome of quenching. And then the second part of my talk, I want particularly to talk about a new paper which was on AstroPH just a day or two ago, where we've gone back uh, and looked again at Sloan, and I think uh, developed a little bit our understanding there uh, about uh, environmental effects, central satellites, and so on, and in particular, the role of this uh, uh, effect called conformity, which I want to spend some time talking about because I think it's uh, not, often not a, it's a slightly confusing concept. Okay, so just to remind you, uh, uh, Marcello also talked about this, you know, one of the, I think, striking things about to the effects of quenching today is this separability between the effects of mass and environment, environment here just being a sort of nearest neighbor density. Uh, the red fraction is then completely separable in those two variables. We can write it like this. And this then leads to the idea that those two uh, separable terms, uh, one we call the mass quenching and one we call uh, environment quenching. And the point is this one then for this separability is nominally independent of mass, and this one is nominally independent of environment, uh, and so on. And uh, given that, of course, it's only mass quenching which uh, depends on mass, and therefore it is mass quenching which determines, if you like, the mass function of the surviving star-forming galaxies. And I think one of the important things is then to see how that mass function uh, is itself a very strong diagnostic of the action of quenching at any epoch. And when you look at that then, one finds the striking result, which I believe is, is, is quite stable. It's not universal in the sense that not every analysis gets this, but many do, and I think as a broad statement it's pretty robust, that the shape of the uh, mass function of star-forming galaxies uh, is independent of redshift, now I think that's established back to redshifts of about four. Independent uh, in the characteristic Schecter M star, independent uh, more or less in the faint end slope alpha, but increasing uh, with time in the vertical normalization phi star. And this, for instance, is just uh, the Cosmos data, which I think is a particularly nice analysis, a very large field, obviously. And then uh, the evolution from redshifts of zero to three and a half or so in Schecter M star and phi star. Uh, it's, it's really quite impressively vertical. And Peter's, uh, most of you will know, did a nice compilation of results from the literature, and this is then fitting those sort of mass functions, and again, very similar sort of vertical behavior. And so this then, uh, in order to keep uh, characteristic Schecter M star the same, uh, to keep the shape of the mass function the same, even though individual objects are growing substantially in stellar mass, at least an order of magnitude since redshift of two, if they stay on the main sequence, then the quenching rate has to have a form like this. This is a mass dependent term because of the correlation, obviously, on the main sequence between star formation rate and mass. And this uh, is a mass independent term, which is like almost a, a sort of constant of integration. And so it's natural then to assign this to the environment quenching part, and this is then the mass quenching. And the key thing is that the observation of constant M star then means that the mass scale, at least in stellar mass, that is associated with quenching, with mass quenching at least, uh, is essentially the same over a colossal range of redshift. And I think this is really a very striking feature of quenching in the universe. Okay, 
then, uh, as I think people know, you can then make clear predictions of the production of passive galaxies, and in particular the mass functions thereof, and basically mass quenching will produce a one component with the same M star and a different alpha uh, change by one relative to the star forming population. The satellite or satellite quenching, the environment quenching, uh, then produces the same M star and the same alpha, just because it's independent of mass, of course. And so, you know, a reason to take all this seriously is then when you look at Sloan, say, at the mass functions of red and blue centrals and satellites, one finds very nice. Uh, confirmation of that. The point, perhaps just to stress, again, in the context of some of the things that's been discussed, the expectation, just from continuity, is that this characteristic M star should be the same uh, for all of these different populations. It is to a pretty good uh, accuracy. And so the, uh, the conclusion is that the average increase in this increase in stellar mass of a galaxy between when it leaves the observed star-forming mass function and appears in today's passive population must be quite modest. And, you know, I think one could get up to 50%, but I think it would be uncomfortable to be more than that. And that, of course, is any mass increase either during quenching or afterwards due to merging. Of course, more massive galaxies uh, will have had more, and th this excess here is undoubtedly due to uh, merging, pushing a lucky few out to very high masses. Okay, uh, quite an interesting thing is, again, from continuity, there's a very clear prediction about the number of objects which will be seen quenching, actually in the process of quenching. And from continuity, one can work this out. And int interestingly, uh, uh, M star and alpha are given, again, nicely in terms of the input star-forming mass function, but then the normalization, the number of those objects, uh, the ratio, if you like, of the phi star of the quenching population to the phi star of the input star-forming population is given by this term, which is just the product of the cosmic SSFR, factor 20 high at redshift of 2 times this visibility time scale. Interestingly, in a, a paper we're just about to wrap up, we've been looking at the X-ray uh, selected AGN luminosity function, and a striking thing there is that the ratio of the quasar luminosity function phi star, the break in the quasar luminosity function, to the galaxy mass function phi star is impressively constant back to redshifts of three. At high, higher redshifts, it becomes uh, indetermined, basically. But back to redshifts of two or three, it's impressively constant. And there's no hint of this increase uh, here. And so perhaps the conclusion there is, for AGN at least, there's no sign of this I increase in the duty cycle, which would be naively expected. Of course, I can adjust this or something, so it's not a compelling argument. But I think the, the general point is this is a clear prediction that can be applied to any set of objects which are thought to be quenching, as long as you can estimate this visibility timescale. Okay, I don't want to say a lot about structure and morphology because I don't really work on it and it's been amply covered uh, this morning. I would just like, though, to make one, I think, quite important point. This correlation, this diagram between the uh, stellar density and the activity of galaxies in Sloan has, of course, that Joanna, for instance, was highlighting, has been known for many years. Okay, uh, from particularly Kaufman 2003 uh, did, did this particular analysis in Sloan. What I think is not always remembered is that uh, similar analyses at high redshift show that this sort of break uh, characteristic stellar mass above which objects are quenched and below which they are not uh, it is seen all the way out to high redshifts, and in particular, one can just track the evolution of the uh, SSFR and this character characteristic surface mass density between redshifts of zero and two. 
And interestingly, not surprisingly, the change in the SSFR is just the cosmic SSFR, so that's the usual factor of 20 or so. But the change uh, in surface density is 0.8. In other words, the critical surface density is going as something like 1 plus z to the 1.6. And I remind you that, and this came up in the earlier discussion, uh, when one looks at the sizes of typical star-forming objects uh, over a range of redshifts, uh, they, uh, at the same mass, are smaller at high redshifts, and therefore one can compute a sort of, if you like, characteristic stellar surface density uh, of star-forming galaxies, and that also scales exactly the same. In other words, the, this threshold mass is scaling in the same way with redshift as the, uh, the, the surface mass density of the objects which are star forming. If, if it wasn't, you know, it might be a little surprising. But the point is, is, I think, you know, this observation, assuming it's right, and it's a fairly robust result found in different studies, uh, you know, then has a number of implications. First, as I said, it, mu crit then tracks this. Uh, it's why you might expect quenched objects always to have a higher surface density. If an object is quenched, it formed its stars at early times, obviously. Uh, and all galaxies were forming stars at early times uh, at much higher density. That's what this diagram is showing. If a galaxy is still star forming, then... Uh, then uh, uh, one would expect them to have lower densities as observed. And then finally, of course, given also this strong increase in the number of quenched objects, uh, the, uh, this leads to strong progenitor bias effects in the uh, uh, passive galaxy population, as Marcella talked about at some length. And then finally, and Simon Beer talked about this, just to sort of say again, this point that you know, I think we all understand, we all think we understand more or less the shape of, of the uh, stellar mass to halo mass curve. Here we have inefficient conversion of stars to baryons in galaxies. Over here we have the effects of mass quenching, whatever physically is causing that. And there is, to me at least, this rather striking fact that this is a rather sharp peak. And furthermore, it's a rather sharp peak not so far below, and you may or may not like this model, but this is the uh, Beruzi curves and this is the Moster curves. You know, this peak is rather close to the ceiling. One could have imagined if this increase of galactic star formation efficiency had sort of just gone on unlimited, it would have come up and it would have reached some peak, some plateau, presumably not so far from, where, from here, it can't go above this ceiling, and so it might have come across uh, before then quenching kicked in and came down, or quenching might have happened before it ever got here. And so the fact that it sort of gets up just here and then quenches, I think, is, is telling us something. It may be just a coincidence because of the way winds are driven and, and whatever's doing the quenching, but I think it, it's quite interesting. Interestingly, the other interesting point, of course, this mass scale related is also when uh, the galaxies find themselves in groups, okay? And of course, this is also related because at this mass scale, as the halo grows, the things which it's merging with to grow have also been very efficient at making baryons into stars, and so quite massive galaxies are coming in and we start to call it a group. Okay, so, uh, so we just have that. So that just sort of summarizes, I think, some of the really top-level <coughs> perspectives on, star for me, uh, on quenching, which come from looking at the galaxy population, how it changes with time, uh, and applying continuity equations and so on. So the second topic I want to address then uh, is now looking at environmental effects in, in Sloan. And in particular, I just want to remind people that my whole discussion really will be in terms of this satellite quenching efficiency or a more general quenching efficiency. This was introduced uh, several years ago, I think by Frank Van den Bosch, and we've certainly used it a lot. If you look at just the red fraction of centrals and satellites with stellar mass, then the centrals are consistently less quenched 
uh, fractionally than the satellites. And this, quen this satellite quenching efficiency is then simply the extra red fraction of satellites divided by the, uh, the sort of surviving blue centrals. In other words, uh, figuratively, lo loosely, if you like, epsilon sat is the probability that a previously star-forming central is quenched when it becomes a satellite. Okay, so it's basically this divided by uh, this. And the reason we like it so much is it takes out uh, the effects of mass uh, as, if you like, given by the centrals to isolate the effects of the environment. Okay, so all of the discussion will be in terms of this quantity. Just as an aside for the enthusiasts, one of the difficulties of this is hitherto has been one has to sort of get these, uh, get, get these uh, red fractions, and that involves a binning. And so uh, the need to bin to get the parameter uh, has been a bit of an issue, particularly as samples go down as you increase the number of parameters. Uh, and so one of the things we've done here is now we have an object-by-object estimator, which makes the estimation of epsilon sat for groups of satellites uh, much more straightforward. You just have to basically average that estimator over the satellites in question. OK, so uh, there's three things I want to just quickly discuss. The first is I want to look again at this central satellite uh, distinction. And uh, here's the uh, quenched fraction of centrals as a function of uh, density and mass. Here's the same for satellites. This is very much uh, familiar to people. If I then work out this epsilon sat quantity, it looks like this. Here is, for instance, the rather striking mass independence. This is stellar mass of the satellite, mass independence of this quantity. So this is all uh, as before. However, let's now look, uh, let's now distinguish between the general centrals and the centrals of the groups in which the satellites reside. And this turns out to be rather critical. This is now the equivalent of this, but just for the centrals in the same groups who are providing the satellites. And you can see, obviously, it's over, only over here in the right of the diagram, but uh, it turns out this is rather more quenched than these. If I now do the equivalent of this diagram by normalizing, by working out a quenching efficiency relative to the field centrals, then I get this, and this should be compared with this, and they start to look rather similar. In other words, it looks like the centrals in the groups which are providing the satellites feel the environment in the same way as their satellites do in terms of this sort of excess environmental quenching efficiency. And finally, if I actually do the same analysis for the satellites, but now using the centrals of the same groups, then uh, there's very little difference at all. And so the uh, upshot of this is to argue that actually the central satellite distinction has come about because uh, we're talking about the cent general centrals, which are generally not in the same environments as, as the general satellites. Here, for instance, is just a matching stellar mass, the blue fraction of centrals and satellites. But if I now look at just the centrals of the same groups as the satellites, if I even match in overdensity and match in R, that difference has completely gone away. So a conclusion there, then, is that centrals and satellites feel the same effects. And so we would, if you like, want to uh, distinguish now between what we've hitherto called satellite quenching. It's more generally a group quenching. It's true that it's the satellites which are driving all of the environmental differentiation of the galaxy population, but that's just because they're so numerous. Most galaxies are isolated centrals. These are then the satellites we've been talking about. And the centrals of these groups, obviously, are a small fraction of those, simply because each group has many more satellites than, than its one central. Okay? So uh, this is an argument, again, to link the, the, uh, the quenching of centrals and satellites more than perhaps has been done in the past. Okay, the next thing uh, quickly to say, but I haven't got a lot new to 
say here. We can look at the variation of this satellite quenching efficiency, looking at the satellites just because there's so many more of them than the centrals in the groups, and just look at the variation of this quantity with satellite mass, halo mass, central mass, uh, over density, radius relative to an RMS radius, and the star formation rate, specific star formation rate of the central. And basically, uh, we recover the well-known independence of MSAT and so on, almost independence of MSEN. But in the other parameters, there are significant variations with, with them. On 2D plots, we uh, see you know, a rather complex behavior. We and, and others have made slightly simplistic comments in the past. For instance, we focused on a slice through here and argued that there was only a very weak dependence on halo mass. We still see that, but clearly, overall, it's a rather more complex behavior. I don't want to say uh, really much more about that, but I do want to spend my last few minutes focusing on this very strong effect with the specific star formation rate of the central. And this is an effect called conformity, which has been uh, discussed before, but I think uh, is really very much more important than, uh, uh, than perhaps has been realized. Uh, just as a preliminary on this, you know, we talk about quenching probabilities and so on, but of course galaxies aren't probabilistic, presumably, they're not quantum systems. And so that prob probabilistic aspect reflects, presumably, the action of variables which are in a quantum mechanical sense hidden. And they could be a number of things, you know, known and measured but not yet included in the analysis. They could be not yet astrophysically measurable. They could be not measurable because of the complexity of the system. They could be the unknown unknowns, etc. Uh, and they could also, by the way, be simple residuals from measurement uncertainties. But the probabilistic aspect, you know, is there because we, it's incomplete knowledge. So what does conformity mean? Conformity basically means that there's a correlation between red centrals and red satellites. Now, <clears throat> you'd get this trivially if you had any variable which was affecting the quenching of centrals and satellites, which somehow was shared, like halo mass. If you just said halo mass is quenching satellites and quenching centrals, and I then just take a set of, of, of satellites, you'd automatically find that the red ones had red centrals because they were in the halo masses that were quenching both. That's a relatively trivial effect. And in particular, if I match in, stellar, in halo mass, if I look at a single halo mass, or if I rather also look at a set of satellites which are matched in halo mass, then it will go away and there will be no such conformity. And that's actually what Weinmann et al. did uh, in 2006. So <clears throat> conformity depends very much on how you do the analysis. If you see conformity, then it means that these hidden variables, which are controlling quenching, uh, must satisfy these conditions. They must affect the quenching of both. They must be shared in some way, like halo mass or some way like that. They must be still hidden in the sense they haven't been exposed in the analysis. Uh, and finally, by the way, they must be orthogonal to the parameters which have been exposed, which have been included in the analysis. Okay, now conformity then is very strong, uh, particularly if I look at this epsilon sat and I now carefully match in all five of the environment parameters I've been dealing with. So I've matched the satellites in their stellar mass, in the halo mass, in the overdensity, in the radius, and even in the mass of the central. But I have those which have a red central and those which have a blue central. Then you can see that basically the quenching efficiency, this epsilon sat, is two and a half times stronger for those with a red central than those with a blue. Yeah. Okay, now how does then uh, quenching, how does this conformity vary uh, across parameter space? Well, at essentially across the whole of parameter space, we see this conformity effect. These are the variations with epsilon sat, uh, of epsilon sat 
with these parameters for the red and the blue centrals. And in every case, the blue centrals have much smaller environmental effects on their satellites uh, than do the red ones. If we do a strength of conformity, uh, where perhaps confusion, confusingly, uh, this strength of one means no conformity and a strength of zero means strong conformity, just because I preferred numbers between zero and one rather than one and infinity, uh, then you can see strong effects, uh, strong variations in the strength of conformity across mass. Uh, conformity, say, is strong in low mass halos and weak for high mass ones. Uh, the strength of conformity, however, appears, say, roughly independent of radius. Okay. <clears throat> so conclusions from this is conformity uh, is a uh, strong effect. Even when all other parameters are matched, we still have this factor of two and a half in the strength of the environmental uh, quenching. <clears throat> two obvious possibilities is that either the quenching of satellites is being driven by a halo-wide effect which follows from the mass quenching of the central by whatever mechanism, or, of course, the, the possibility that both of them are being caused, again, by halo-wide effects shared by the centrals and satellites, uh, including, by the way, things like the formation history of the halo would be an obvious possibility. And so this also leads in the same direction that Marcello was talking about of is our mass quenching and environment quenching essentially the same? And I think there are some arguments in favor. The obvious one that they have very different mass dependencies is not important because it turns out that when I look at the distribution of all of these relevant environment variables uh, for the satellites, those distributions were essentially independent of the stellar mass of the satellite. Okay? And so you would automatically get a mass independent halo, a mass independent environment effect. So that's fine. And the final thing I just want to leave you with is there's a, another sort of interesting coincidence that if I just look at the variation of epsilon sat with, say, halo mass for again red centrals and blue centrals, okay, and I just extrapolate down really where we don't have data, the sort of mass where these environment effects are kicking in on the satellites is, of course, exactly the halo mass that is associated with the stellar mass, which is clearly associated over a huge range of redshift with the mass quenching. OK, so uh, that is just to summarize. Thank you. Yes. Whether the halo can support hot CGM sure. for a long time. Uh, this is correlated with halo mass. Yes. But it's not one to one. Of course. In and other words, yeah. you have to be above some halo mass, but that's not enough yeah. to guarantee that you have a hot halo. Right. That's why the halo mass is not a one to one measure of quenching. Yeah. But it's correlated with having a hot yeah, halo. Yeah. Yeah. And probably the problem you're looking for is just Quite. Distance of a shock, whatever. As an aside, moving towards the halo picture from having been resolute, well, not resolutely, agnostically outside of it, and of course a little perturbed now to see some of the people I thought were perhaps most strongly on the halo picture now talking about internal galaxy effects, which is where I was perhaps coming from there. But that's the nature of science. <laughs> it's, it's also the nature, it's the nature of science. So, yeah. so there are two recent papers on galactic conformity that uh, only one of which you actually cited, yeah. uh, incorrectly listing the author as Hearn. Yeah. Uh, Alex Hearn. Right. Yeah. Uh, it's Hearn, Watson, mm -hmm. and Van Centrals, if they're quenched, 
are correlated with quenching out to four megaparsecs, mm -hmm. far beyond yeah. the halo. And so the paper by Heron et al. emphasizes mm -hmm. that this is a two-halo effect. If you think of it in terms of the mm -hmm. HOD composition, this is definitely not an internal halo effect. So they also point out that their age-matching story, yeah. unlike any of the uh, mm -hmm. semi-analytic models that I'm aware of, naturally predicts it. Yeah. No. So, so uh, uh, as I think I said, time. No, 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 not uh, no. Massive galaxies sure. and out to just the halo, and not talking yeah. about this amazing effect that was first right. discussed. Time, the time the since something happened, okay, or build up history of the halo. Again, I have no problem at all. That's a perfect hidden common variable. Right. You know, so it's 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 consistent. I'm perhaps but the yeah. you showed, as far as I can yeah. tell, didn't go beyond the radius of the halo. No. Whereas the effect is that's so striking and maybe really telling us something new is that to the lower mass central it seems to go far beyond the halo. Yeah, I don't know if Marcello wants to comment on that, but uh, if, if you could keep it to less than thirty seconds.